All right, good morning. All right, well, um, yeah, a few things about me. Some of you might remember, um, I have a little bit of a history here back in the day when I was in youth group. Oh, by the way, you thought she moved around? I was told I could move around, so look out. Um, yeah, if you're old enough to remember when I was in youth group here, you're probably older than I am. And it's nice to see some other faces I recognize from the back roads. I see some McClinchies and a Martellacci out there. Nice to see you guys. Uh, I live in Exeter now with my wife, Gail. We've been married 33 and a half years. We've got two adult children. They're both married and three grandchildren. The, the uh, most recent one's only about three weeks old. But I'm here today as part of Creation Ministries International. Now, you may know that we have offices in seven countries around the world, and uh, we, one of the interesting things about what we do is that we not only partner with a global community of Bible-believing scientists, we also employ quite a few PhD scientists ourselves. I'm not one of them. Okay, I'm a regular guy. But as a ministry, we have two goals. We want to encourage you in your faith and let you know it's okay to believe the Bible the way it's written right from the very first verse. There's lots of scientific evidence that backs up what the Bible says about origins. Now, we're not looking to science to prove the Bible. The Bible is the Word of God, so that's our authority. But we do find that the science backs up what the Bible says very, very well. We also want to give you some information to help you uh, in your witnessing. I'm sure we all know people who are skeptical of the Bible's claims because of things that they've heard in school or in the media, things about millions of years and so on. So we want to give you some information to help you have an intelligent conversation with the skeptics that you know and hopefully get them a little closer to understanding that the Bible really can be trusted. And if the Bible can be trusted when it talks about origins, then it can also be trusted when it talks about salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. You see, that's the ultimate goal, right? It's not about winning an argument here. We want to see people uh, put their faith in the Bible and ultimately put their faith in Jesus. So we are an information ministry. Of course, we have a website. Our website's fairly easy to remember. It's called creation.com. Say it with me. There'll be a test later. Great place to go if you have any questions to do with the book of Genesis, anything to do with uh, scientific matters that come into play, could be fossils, distant starlight, uh, DNA. There's over 10,000 articles on this one website. Hundreds of videos as well, including every episode of our TV show, Creation Magazine Live. That's a half hour show we film right in our kitchen or office, and uh, we do it on a green screen. So that means that nothing in that picture is real except for the two guys. They are real, honest. Now, a few years back, a friend of mine told me a story about his niece. She was about five or six years old at the time, and she had heard the creation account from the Bible, how God created the heavens and the earth in six days. On the seventh day, he rested. After hearing this, the little girl apparently said, How do you know? Who was there? I said, those are valid questions. It may surprise you to hear me say that, but let's, do, uh, let's think about this logically for a moment. Let's do a quick review of the creation account from Genesis 1. In the beginning, God said, let there be light. He separated light from darkness. There was evening, there was morning, one day. On day two, God created an expanse around the earth. On day three, he separated land from water and created vegetation. On day four, God created the sun, the moon, and the stars. On day five, he created birds and sea creatures. And then on day six, all of the land animals, as well as man in his own image, both male and female. On the seventh day, he rested. So you can see the little girl's logic. She's thinking, well, there were no people around till day six. So how do you know? Who was there? I said, those are valid questions, but... I hope she uses the same logic when she goes to school and they tell her about the Big Bang and evolution. You've probably heard this idea before as well. How something like 13.8 billion years ago, 
there was nothing, then suddenly a very tiny something which exploded. And then about 4.6 billion years ago, uh, our solar system, including the Earth, began to form. Almost a billion years after that, there were lifeless chemicals on the Earth. And from those lifeless chemicals came the first tiny living organism, life from no life. And then over the course of billions of years, that tiny organism gradually evolved into things that are more complex, fish and birds and so on. And eventually modern man evolved. All of this over billions of years. So I said, I hope she asked the same question. How do you know? Who was there? Because you see, if we compare these two histories, we'll find that for creation, we've really only got five or six days to account for before there were people around to tell about it. For the evolution idea or the, the naturalist idea, well, there's billions of years of what they call prehistory with nobody around. Now, of course, that's not the only difference between these two histories, is it? I mean, how do we know the creation account to start with? We've read it. It's written down. It's in the Bible. It's in the Word of God. And speaking of God, there He is in the very first verse. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So that addresses one of the questions right there. Who was there? God was there. Before there was man or an earth or even time itself, there was God. And of course, God inspired Moses and other eyewitnesses to write down the Word of God. And God Himself is an eyewitness to His own creation. He made sure it got written down in a way that we can read it and understand it even today. So, we compare these two histories again. We'll find that for creation, we have a written record. We have eyewitness testimony. And behind it all is God. For the evolution idea, or the naturalist idea, well, there's no written record. There's no eyewitnesses for billions of years. And no God. Or at least, no God required. Because you see, that whole idea is put forward to try to answer the question, what if there's no God? If there is no God who created the heavens and the earth, it must have created itself somehow, and that must have taken billions of years. So what we end up with is very two very different histories coming from two different starting assumptions. Now somebody could be thinking, well, hasn't science proven that the earth is billions of years old? Let's think of a, a few key points about science. First of all, evolution is not synonymous with science. It's not like it's uh, evolution and science over here versus creation and faith over here. Creation and science have always gone hand in hand. Unfortunately, sometimes science gets confused with history. And the facts don't speak for themselves. So if we think about science for a moment, remember what you learned in school. Uh, we make some observations. We form a hypothesis of what we think might happen or, or try to uh, understand what we observed. And then we run experiments to test our hypothesis. It's observable. It's testable. It's repeatable. But sometimes it gets confused with history. Maybe you've heard terms like historical science or forensic science. These are terms we use when we want to use science to try to figure out what happened in the past. Of course, a great way to know what happened in the past would be to have an eyewitness. Maybe they wrote it down. If we don't have an eyewitness, the best we can do is look at evidence in the present and try to figure it out from that. But science is limited here. Science is meant for making observations in the present. You can't really run an experiment on something that already happened in the past, and the farther back you go, the harder it gets. And unfortunately, the facts don't speak for themselves. I'll give you an example. Suppose we find a dinosaur fossil. Now, there are certain things we can learn about it by studying it, look to see where we found it, how much has it decayed, its composition, and so forth. Those would be the observable facts. Therefore, that's in the realm of science. However, that bone doesn't come with a tag attached to it that says things like, Hi, my name is Parasaurolophus. You can call me Para for short. My eyes are blue, and I was born April 15th, 75 million years ago. Right? It doesn't come with that much information. But if you read an article about a fossil find, it'll usually say something about how old it is, how it got there, things that nobody observed. Well, since the facts don't speak for themselves to that degree, 
we have to make an interpretation on the evidence that we find. And our interpretations are always based within a set of presuppositions. A framework of ideas or biases, if you will, that we already hold to be true. And everybody does this. There's really no such thing as a completely unbiased scientist. A biblical creationist, for example, would say, well, the Bible is real history. God created the heavens and the earth. And so we base our interpretations within that framework. An evolutionist, on the other hand, the naturalist, might say, well, the Bible's irrelevant. All that's out there is no God. All that's out there is the material universe, and it created itself over billions of years. So then what we end up with is very different interpretations coming from two different sets of presuppositions or worldviews, but it's the same evidence. So let's go back to our fossil for a moment. We can observe certain things about this fossil, the observable facts. We would call that operational science. But as soon as we start talking about how old it is, how it got there, things we didn't observe, well, now we need to use an interpretation coming from some kind of worldview. And now we have science and history getting mixed up, right? But they're two different things. Sometimes the history is based on things that are written down. Sometimes it's a speculation. Now... I'm sure we all want our children to be critical thinkers, you know, look at different sides of an argument. But you know it's really hard to be a critical thinker if you're only ever given the same interpretation of evidence uh, year after year from the time you're a little kid reading a dinosaur book all the way to university. And maybe you don't get a chance to look at another possibility. Now, it's not hard to get this kind of millions of years interpretation everywhere we turn. It's a lot harder to get an interpretation of the same evidence that fits in a biblical framework. Well, that's why ministries like ours exist. That's why we have a website. That's why we have all those scientists. That's why we have resources like our email newsletter called InfoBytes. This is an email we send out that highlights a few key articles from the website from time to time, mentions upcoming events. It's a way of getting a little bit of our information uh, in your email that doesn't cost you anything. Now, we have other ways of connecting with us online as well, uh, on Facebook, Instagram, other social media. I'm going to ask the ushers if you would uh, pass out that first set of clipboards with the Connect cards on it. If you would like to connect with our ministry by email or some kind of social media, then what you can do is take one of these uh, blue forms off from the clipboard. They're all perforated. Uh, fill it out with your name and your email address. And then check off the number of ways on the side that you'd like to connect. Maybe you already get our emails. You can connect some other way in addition to this. And bring that form with you downstairs where the, uh, where the coffee and cookies are. Bring that to the table downstairs after the service. And if you decide to buy something today and bring that form to the table, then I'll give you a free sleeve DVD as kind of a, a little bonus. Now, if you don't want to buy anything, that's fine. Uh, you can just bring the form down there and just sign up. Uh, but either way, you need to bring that form downstairs after the service. I'm going to suggest that we just go ahead and pass those around as we continue. Now, of course, this morning we're talking about the book of Genesis. And somebody could be thinking, well, you know, I heard Genesis is a side issue. You know, it's not real history, it's not about science, and it's not as important as other major doctrines like the gospel, for example. Well, let's see how important Genesis is. I want to start with Romans 6.23. But for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Well, that's the gospel message, isn't it? The wages of sin is death. Because there's sin, there's death. Sin separates us from God. That's the bad news. The good news is, if we put our faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who lived a sinless life and then died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins and then rose from the dead, by faith in Him we can have eternal life. That's the great news of the gospel that we have to share with the world. But you see, it all sort of hinges on the idea that the wages of sin is death. Well, where do we get that idea? Let's take a look at Genesis 2. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Now, God had created plants to be food for not just animals, but people as well. As of the end of day six, nobody was eating meat, no bloodshed, no carnivory. 
And specifically, God tells Adam, you can eat from any tree in the garden, but if you eat from that tree, you will surely die. The implication being there wasn't any death in the world up until that point. Of course, there wasn't any sin up until that point. And you may recall how it went. Adam and Eve ate the fruit. They disobeyed God. They sinned. That brought the curse of death into the world. Everything now dies because of that curse, because of sin. They received both physical and spiritual death, which we inherit from them, and that's why we need a Savior. See, we understand that Jesus lived and died and rose again in real history. But, you know, if there was not a literal Adam who literally sinned and brought literal death into the world, then why would we need a literal Savior to die a literal death on a literal cross and literally rise from the dead to save us from our sins? You see, there's got to be something historical about Genesis for the gospel to fully make sense. How about marriage? In Mark chapter 10, Jesus said, But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Now, he's talking to people who want to allow for divorce for different reasons, but he's saying, no, no, God's idea from the beginning was one man, one woman, one flesh for life. And to back up his argument, he's actually quoting from both Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. Some say those chapters contradict each other, but they don't. You see, Jesus understood Genesis as real history. Do we believe Jesus? Now, somebody could be thinking, okay, look, you know, we hear so much about evolution. I mean, maybe they go together somehow. Maybe we can take the two ideas and mash them together. Maybe God even used evolution some way. And a number of well-meaning theologians have tried to find ways to do that. Let's see how well that works. I want to start with what the Bible says about those six days of creation. And on the seventh day, God rested. And then let's see if we can add in the evolution idea as represented by those many layers of rock that are full of fossils. Layers, we're told, represent millions of years of slow and gradual evolution. Of course, that would mean millions of years of pain and and bloodshed and death and disease, right? Because those fossils are remains of actual living creatures, right? There's evidence of bloodshed and carnivory in the fossil record. There's even cancer in the fossil record. So we need to take this into account if we want to roll those millions of years of evolution into the Bible somewhere. Well, let's see if we can put them in before creation week, before day one. Remember the first verse, in the beginning God created. Now, if God used millions of years of evolution to create before that, well, does that mean that there were two beginnings? Did God start over and he didn't tell us about it? And then how do you account for all of that death going on before sin? Because remember, death came into the world as a result of sin. There was no sin until there was an Adam. There was no Adam until day six. If God used millions of years of evolution to create before that, well, then that would mean millions of years of, of, of death going on before sin. Meaning death is then not the result of sin. And if death isn't the result of sin, then why do we need a Savior? This undermines the gospel message. Genesis 1.31, God saw all that he had made and it was very good. Maybe you've pictured the Garden of Eden the way it looked at that point. You know, Adam and Eve are there with the animals. It's all very beautiful. God calls his whole creation very good. But if he's used millions of years of evolution to get that far, then, well, they're already standing on a bone pile that's a mile deep in many places. And there you got all that death and bloodshed and disease, even thorns. Kind of calls into question the character of a God that would call that very good. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul tells us the last enemy to be destroyed is death. All through Scripture, we're led to believe death is a bad thing. I think we know that. In fact, Jesus came to defeat death, amongst other things. So then, why would God use millions of years of death in order to create? It doesn't really fit. So if the millions of years of evolution don't fit before creation week, maybe we put them in during creation week. What if the days aren't literal days? Maybe each one is a long period of time, like a billion years. 
Well, Hebrew scholars from around the world, people who don't even believe the Bible, have affirmed that the word yom in Hebrew for day, in the context we find it in, in Genesis 1, with a series of numbers and so on, in that context, it always means a literal day. And then we have Exodus 20.11. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. You ever wonder why a week is seven days and not ten? Why are we supposed to work six days and rest on the seventh? Because that's what God did. Now, he wasn't tired. This is Almighty God. He could have done it all in an instant. He could have done it in billions of years. Instead, He did it in six earth rotation days, and He set that as a pattern for us. So if you think about it, if each one of those days was really a billion years, Who's looking forward to Monday? Only five billion years of the weekend. Now, if God wanted to create in billions of years, He could have done that. He would have told us that's what He did. Instead, He's made it very clear, and He even wrote it here in the Ten Commandments. And in this model, we'd still have the problem of death before sin. So really, the only place the fossils can fit in biblical history because they represent death is sometime after sin comes along, which would be after creation week. But can they be millions years of years old? In Genesis 5 and 11, we find chronogenealogies. Now, these aren't just lists of names that say Adam begat Seth and so on. There's a measured number of years given there. So many years from Adam to his son, so many years from Seth to his son and so on. And we can follow that chronology and do the math from Adam all the way to Abraham And that adds up to approximately 2,000 years. Then we look at other biblical history and some other sources, and we find that Abraham was born probably somewhere around 2,000 B.C. Well, that gives us a total world history then of only about 6,000 years. Some suggest maybe a little more than that, but certainly not millions. So if the millions of years of evolution don't fit with what the Bible says, then maybe we could alter our hypothesis of trying to mash the ideas together. And let's ask the question, are those layers of rock and the fossils really millions of years old? I mean, how long does it take for a fossil to form, for example? In the past, we've been taught it's a slow process. It could take millions of years. But then we find things like this. This is an entire school of 257 fish, all of them fossilized in formation facing the same way. Researchers don't understand how this is possible because they're still thinking about slow processes. But all you really need is a whole lot of sediment to land on there and bury them all rather quickly. Now back in Charles Darwin's day, he didn't believe that soft-bodied creatures like jellyfish could possibly be fossilized because he thought it was a slow process. They'd decay. Well, we do find jellyfish fossils that are very well preserved. Interestingly enough, they look pretty much exactly like jellyfish of today, and yet the fossils are supposed to be 500 million years old. Those are known as living fossils. There's no evolution there. Now, there's other things in the fossil record that indicate those fossils are not millions of years old. Over the last 30 years, there's now been dozens of discoveries of soft tissue in dinosaur bones. Bones that we're told are tens of millions of years old or more, but we find things like blood cells, proteins, collagen, DNA, highly unstable biological things that operational science tells us don't last anywhere close to millions of years. We find them in fossils that we're told are even older than that. Powerful evidence that these things are not millions of years old. Now, when we start talking about biology, we can get into the question of natural selection. Natural selection is an actual process. Some of you have maybe even uh, witnessed it. Maybe some of you have used artificial selection. Some of you uh, farmers, for example, right? You You want fatter cows, breed fatter cows. You want faster dogs, breed faster dogs. We can do that sort of thing artificially. So-called purebreds aren't really all that pure. It means they have less genetic information than the mutt. Right? Well, it happens naturally, too. And we're told that natural selection is the same as evolution. 
But when we're talking about evolution, we're talking about starting with a single cell common ancestor and moving upwards and get everything else, including human beings. Well, in order to do that, you have to have a massive increase in new genetic information that wasn't there before because you need things to code for skin and hair and so on, right? So consider that single cell common ancestor. There's a certain amount of information in its DNA, Right? The, the simplest single cell uh, creature we know of has about 500,000 chemical letters in its DNA. But if you want to go to a human being at 3 billion base pairs of those chemical letters, you need a massive increase in that genetic information. Question is, can natural selection do that? I want to take an example of a population of dogs. We're going to look at one trait. We're just going to look at the length of fur. Now, all of your traits are coded in your DNA in genes, and generally speaking, you get more than one version of a gene or alleles, all right? And you don't necessarily pass on the same ones. So in this case, we've got a population of dogs. These two have uh, a long-haired gene and a short-haired gene, so they've got medium-length fur. Now, when they have offspring, they're each going to pass on one of those versions of the gene, but not always the same one. So... You're going to get some dogs that have the long-haired gene from one, the short-haired gene from the other, or vice versa, and you'll have a medium fur. Some of those dogs will get the short-haired gene from mom and the short-haired gene from dad. They'll have short fur. Some, of course, are going to get the long-haired gene from both, and they'll have long fur. Makes sense so far? Right? We've seen this, right? right? Think about those cows and dogs I mentioned earlier. Think of your own children. They don't all look the same, right? So we see that kind of variation. Now, let's move those dogs to the Arctic, someplace really, really cold. Which ones of those do you think are most likely to survive? Ones with long hair, right? Ones with short and medium fur, they're more likely to die out over time, right? So the ones with long fur, they're going to survive. They're going to have offspring. Now, what length of fur do you think their offspring are going to have? They're all going to have long fur. Right? That's the only gene they have to pass on. They lost the short-haired gene. So there's, no, there's no, no, no other choices here. Now, the evolutionists might look at that and say, well, look, that's evolution in, in process there. Right? They've changed. They've adapted. They survived. But did they gain any new genetic information? No, they lost genetic information. Right? They've only got the long-haired gene. Now, that's of a particular advantage in that environment, but let's move those same dogs now to someplace really, really hot like the Mojave Desert. And they're going to be crying for that short hair gene. And they can't get it back. It's gone from their genetics. You'd have to reintroduce it from outside the population. Right? See, we're told that natural selection is the same as evolution, but it's changed in the wrong direction from what evolution needs. It does, however, fit well in a biblical model where God front-loaded everything with a whole lot of genetic information to allow for adaptation and variation in different species over time. That's what we observe. Let's go back to that rapid burial idea. You go to Joggins Bay in Nova Scotia, you can see the cliffs there. There's all kinds of layers of rock with fossils showing in those layers, and you can see something like that. It's an upright tree trunk completely fossilized through many layers of rock. Layers, we're told, took millions of years to form. Now, I've had dead trees taken down in my backyard. They didn't show any signs of staying upright for millions of years. Something must have happened to bury this thing rapidly so it could be fossilized like that, but then that would mean the layers had to form rapidly. Is that even possible? Well, here's another cliff in Washington State. It's part of a canyon. Uh, it's about 130 feet high here. Now, I'm old enough to remember when Mount St. Helens erupted in 1980. I was about 13 at the time. Yeah, you can do the math if you want. What happened there is three distinct events happened, each on a single day. Each one of those things uh, caused one of the major bands of rock you see here. The first two eruptions about a month apart caused those first bands of rock to form and then mud flows came down from the mountain nearly two years later and we get that third layer. Now there's a, a canyon, as I mentioned, and there's a river going down through the middle of the canyon. 
if we didn't know any better, we might assume the river carved the canyon over millions of years. But when the mud flows came down from the mountain, they carved out a canyon also in a single day. What a difference it makes when we have eyewitness testimony. We get a different interpretation on the same evidence. Now, there's been other cases of canyons formed rather quickly. Go elsewhere in Washington State to Walla Walla. A farmer back in the 1920s had some irrigation ditches that got clogged up, and he ran a bunch of water down through one of them to try to get rid of the blockage. And so then a ditch that looked probably something like this ended up looking like this in six days. So you don't need millions of years to get a canyon. All you need is a whole lot of water and a lot of erosion very, very quickly. And that's the sort of thing we observe, but nobody's ever seen a canyon form in millions of years. So where do we get the idea that sedimentation and erosion always happen over millions of years? It comes from an idea called uniformitarianism. A couple hundred years ago, some geologists suggested the present is the key to the past. So if we see slow and gradual sedimentation in the present, and we do, then the assumption was it's always been like that in the past and it's never changed. But the problem with this logic is it doesn't take into account the possibility of some major catastrophe that could have happened. Something like Mount St. Helens, for example. Or how about a global flood, like the one we read about in Genesis in the days of Noah. Now, some say this was a local, or a local flood. It got exaggerated over time. But what does uh, Gen- the Bible tell us about it? In Genesis 7, we read, And the waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed above the mountains, covering them 15 cubits deep. So this is telling us that all the mountains under the sky were covered in water to a depth of more than 20 feet. This doesn't sound like a local flood to me. In fact, what's described in those chapters is global in proportions. And can you imagine the devastation from that? From that amount of water, the amount of sediment being churned up and laid down again quickly, the number of things buried in that sediment. Jesus referred to it in Luke 17. He said, just as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating and drinking and marrying and being given in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Now, he's talking about uh, his second coming. He's talking about a judgment still to come, saying, you know what, it's going to be just like it was in the days of Noah. Because Jesus understood Genesis to be real history. And so did Peter. Second Peter 3, he said, scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlooked this fact, that the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God, and that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. In the next verse, he too draws a parallel between that watery judgment of the past and a future judgment still to come. And he's telling us here, a time's going to come when people will deny a global flood ever happened, deliberately overlooking that fact despite the evidence. Because, see, for many centuries, people looked at those layers of rock full of fossils and understood that to be evidence for Noah's flood. It made perfect sense. It wasn't until a couple hundred years ago when some theologians started coming up with a different interpretation of those layers that theologians started trying to put millions of years into the Bible. But as we go along, we continue to find more and more evidence that backs up what the Bible says about history. For example, a few years ago, the New Horizon Project did a flyby of Pluto, sent back quite a bit of data that confused evolutionists who believe that Pluto was four and a half billion years old. They found there's fewer impact craters on the surface than there should be after that amount of time. It's geologically active, odd for something they thought would be old, cold, and dead. They find it has a young atmosphere, should have been dissipated long ago at the rate it's going. And the moons orbit in different speeds and even different directions. These and many other things in our solar system defy what is known as the nebular hypothesis for planet formation. It's part of the Big Bang Theory. See, the observations don't really fit that model, but they fit perfectly well with what the Bible tells us. Now, somebody could be thinking, okay, look, you know, 
in the end, creation, evolution. Does it really matter what I believe? Odd thing to ask in a church. Of course, it matters what we believe because ideas have consequences, right? What, whatever you believe about God, about origins, whatever your worldview, that has an effect on how you live your life. The same is true for everybody that we know. Jeff Jacobi explained it this way. He said, for in a world without God, there is no obvious difference between good and evil. There is no way to prove that murder is wrong if there is no creator who decrees, thou shalt not murder. One might reason instead, as Lenin and Stalin and Mao reasoned, that there is nothing wrong with murdering human beings by the millions if doing so advances the Marxist cause. Or one might reason from observing nature that the way of the world is for the strong to devour the weak. Or that natural selection favors the survival of the fittest by any means necessary, including the killing of the less fit. And that last idea has caused a lot of nasty things to be done in our history. For example, there was a school shooting that happened in Finland in 2007. A fellow named Pekka Erik Ovenen. After the shooting, they found this video that he had created in which he said, human life is not sacred. Humans are just a species among other animals. Not all human lives are important or worth saving. Where did he get that idea? He said, I cannot say that I am of the same race as this miserable, arrogant, and selfish human race. No, I have evolved a step higher. I, as a natural selector, will eliminate all who I see unfit, disgraces of the human race, and failures of natural selection. And he went and shot up a whole lot of people in his school. Now, this is obviously an extreme example of somebody who took the idea of evolution a way bit too far, but you can see the logic. It's not an isolated case. So if we go back to these two histories again, look at the bottom line, God, no God, we can ask the question, well, if there is no God, then who says? Right? If there's no God who decides what right and wrong ought to be or, or you know, what the laws should be, well, then who decides that? In the absence of God, we do. People become number one. That's an attractive prospect to anyone who doesn't want to be accountable to God. And, of course, evolution is supposed to explain how everything got here without God. So you can see the attraction there. Now, of course... We live in nations where we have governments, we have to decide what the laws of the land will be, and for hundreds of years in the Western world, those laws have been largely based on a biblical worldview. We look to see what God had to say. But over the last hundred years, and the last 50 years, 60 years especially, we've seen kind of a shift in our culture away from God's ideas to where we're starting to make up some of the rules for ourselves as a culture. Here's some of the things we end up with when we make up the rules for ourselves. We get things like legalized abortion. We get sexual immorality of all different kinds. Leads to things like higher divorce rates, higher rates of teen pregnancies, STDs, all kinds of other nasty side effects. We see eugenics. Programs intended to improve a population by eliminating the ones that some would consider to be less fit. Like the mentally challenged, for example. Now, that's something Hitler and the Nazis are well known for, but it started in universities long before them, and it has its roots in evolutionary thought, and it hasn't gone away. And, of course, euthanasia is in the debate. See, we've seen these things come around, and you know some of these things have actually gone up quite a bit in the last 50 or 60 years in the approximate te- time that we've been teaching evolution in our public schools. Now, it's not a direct cause and effect, you understand, but you can see the logic there. If we teach whole generations of young people, they're just random chance accident from a rock somewhere, that's going to affect their worldview over time, isn't it? That'll affect the worldview of the culture as a whole after a while. And I think we're seeing some of that in our time. And you may be aware it has an effect on the church as well. There have been a number of surveys done showing the number of young people leaving the church as they grow up. Uh, Here's one from the U.S. A study showed that 70% of youth across all Christian denominations indicate they strongly agree that the teachings of science and religion often ultimately conflict with each other. 
Please understand, when they're saying science, they're probably thinking millions of years and evolution. That's what they've been taught as science. Of course, it's really just a speculative history, right? But they get taught that as science, and they've got experts. They've got textbooks. And in the church, maybe we haven't always been that good at showing how the evidence supports what the Bible says. And so people drift away. Evangelist Josh Williamson said, I have spent 13 years in evangelistic work. In that time, I have found that the whole question of creation versus evolution has been the number one reason people give for forsaking Christianity and rejecting the Bible. Now, you could be thinking, I don't want to deal with all this stuff. I don't want to deal with those big issues. Really, all I want to do is share the gospel with people. I want to tell people the good news. You can be saved by faith in Jesus Christ. And I would agree with that. At CMI, we'd agree. The gospel is the number one thing. It's why we do what we do. Because we also know that people have questions. But before we can talk to people about spiritual matters, they often have questions of a more earthly nature. They could be wondering, how come there aren't dinosaurs mentioned in the Bible? Who did Cain marry? How did Noah get all those animals on the ark? What about distant starlight? What about carbon-14? These are the kind of questions people have that act as stumbling blocks to accepting the claims of the Bible. You've probably heard some of these. Maybe you're wondering some of them yourself. Well, the good news is that there's answers to all of those questions. Biblically based and scientifically sound answers to all those questions that people have. Obviously, I'm not suggesting that if we get answers to people that they're automatically going to become Christians. They need to hear the gospel and the Holy Spirit needs to be involved. But this is a big part of the puzzle for many people who won't even consider listening to the Bible until they get their questions answered. Peter tells us in 1 Peter 3.15, In your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. We're supposed to be able to give an answer or make a defense when people question us about our faith. And sooner or later, they're going to question us about things to do with Genesis, flood, fossils, and so on. A friend of mine, Dr. Jim Mason, likes to uh, tell us about the Ebbinghaus forgetting curve. This is a scientific con concept. Uh, came from a fellow named Ebbinghaus back in 1885. Uh, basically, he plotted out the amount uh, that you tend to forget as time goes on after you first hear something. Right? If you've ever written an exam or been married in a length of time, you know how this works. Right? Now, the good news is that you can counteract those effects by simply going back and doing some reading or having somebody remind you of something. Right? You go back and review the information, and then you forget less and less as time goes on. See, this is why we're an equipping ministry. It's why we have all those resources. And our number one equipping resource is the uh, Creation Magazine. It's a family-oriented magazine. comes out every three months. The articles are short and easy to read. It's cutting-edge science done from a creation perspective. And we get testimonies from all over the world from people who've gotten hold of this magazine. A fellow named Ian said uh, he used to be an atheist at one time. Got hold of some magazines. And he said, I soon saw that the more I looked at the evidence for creation and the gaping holes in the evolution story, the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle of life started to fall into place. I came to believe in the creator God of the Bible. And he now uses that magazine in his witnessing. It's a recurring subscription. You sign up for it once, arrange payments to happen automatically, and it's only $7.50 every three months. Not every month, it's every three months. And... Uh, for that, you get a hard copy of the magazine. You can also get a digital copy through your email. You can download it, uh, email it out. And if you want to sign up for the magazine today, I'll give you your first issue of it here for free, as well as a free DVD. These are different DVDs than the other ones I mentioned. Now, I'm going to ask the ushers if you'd uh, grab those clipboards one more time. And this time, if you'd like to receive Creation Magazine for yourself or a gift for somebody else that you know, start getting some of that information for yourself, then uh, grab one of these forms on the uh, clipboard. They're perforated again. This time, you need to fill it out on both the front side and the back. So you need name and address and email on the front. We need your payment information, your signature on the back. And you don't pay anything up front today. Just bring that to me downstairs at the table. Remember, that's where the cookies are, right? A little incentive there. All right. 
Uh, bring that to me downstairs, and uh, we'll get you set up with your free gifts. So now that's two forms that you can bring downstairs, okay? There's the blue one for connecting online somehow. If you want to buy something, you get a free DVD there. And then there's another one you can get for free with the magazine subscription. While those go around, I'll highlight a few of my other favorite resources. The Creation Answers book answers over 60 of the most asked questions that people have to do with Genesis. Could be things to do with Noah's flood. How did all those animals get to Australia? Christianity for Skeptics is more philosophical, answers some of the big questions like why do bad things happen, compares Christianity to other worldviews like Islam and Eastern religions. Those two are available separately or in what we call the faith building pack for a discount. Now, if anybody is in high school or college or heading in that direction, the Creation Survival Guide will help you to navigate an evolutionized school system with your faith intact and still pass the test. Coming off of that, if you want to get a little more in-depth, Evolution's Achilles' Heels is nine PhD scientists showing how the evidence supports biblical creation better than evolution, like natural selection, for example. A couple of our newer ones, we've got one called Titans of the Earth, Sea, and Air, comprehensive uh, book with lots of pictures all about different kinds of dinosaurs. One thing you won't read in there is anything to do with millions of years, done from a biblical perspective. And Dismantles, it is a DVD written by, uh, done by a couple of geneticists who show how what we know from DNA, so that evolution isn't even possible based on what we know from that, and we're learning more all the time. Of course, we want our children to be uh, equipped from a young age, so lots of children's resources available as well. And the big pack, the Creation Library Starter Kit. I love that a pack this size is called a starter kit. Lots of information there, all kinds of different topics available there, heavily discounted, well over $300 worth of materials for just under $200. It's good for a church library or a real creation nut, I mean enthusiast. Okay, this sounded like an infomercial just down, didn't it? But that's not the point. I didn't come here to make a sale. The whole point of our ministry is we want to equip you with information so you can bolster your own faith and so you can have those conversations with the skeptics you know. Maybe they're in your own house. Right? People who are trying to poke holes in your faith. You can have those conversations with them, send them a link to an article, lend them a book, and you can have that chat. But you know what? If you don't want to spend money, get the free stuff, right? Get the emails or go to the website. Who remembers the name of the website? <laughs> Told you there'd be a test. All right. Okay, you can come and find me downstairs where the cookies are. I might be eating some of them. I don't know. But if you want to come talk to me one-on-one, -on -one, I'll be down there after the service. Um, but for now, let's, uh, let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your creation. Thank you how much, for how much you love us, that despite the vastness of this universe, that, um, that you, you are mindful of us and that you love us. Thank you for revealing yourself to us in that creation, in your word, and most especially in your son, Jesus Christ. We ask, Lord, that you would equip us to go forward, to share our faith with others, to engage in conversation and even answer some of the difficult questions from time to time. We ask that you would help us to guide those that we know a little closer to putting their faith in Jesus because ultimately we want to see your kingdom grow. We thank you for all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we're going to